So the last kingdom that we're going to be talking about before we move on to animals and do our dissection is kingdom plantae. So in kingdom plantae, you have living things that are autotrophic, meaning that they make their own energy. They're multicellular, which means that they're made of more than one cell. They have cell walls around their cell membranes, and they're eukaryotic, which means they have a nucleus. All right, so the cuticle and stomata, which we talked about in class, the cuticle is just basically a non-living layer that covers the surface of the leaves, and it prevents the leaves from, desic from desiccating or from drying out. So it's a non-living layer. You can see it's not comprised of cells, and it's usually what gives the waxy feeling to most leaves. Some, we some leaves have a thicker cuticle than others. Down here, you have the stoma or stomata. The stoma is singular, stomata is plural. So if you were to look at the underside of a leaf, um, under a microscope, you would see this picture here, which is essentially a um, stoma. So here we go. So if you're looking at the underside of a leaf under a microscope, you can see these little openings. And these little openings are for gas exchange. So this is the cross section of the leaf here. You can see that uh, CO2 is coming into the plant because plants use CO2, carbon dioxide, and then they give off oxygen. Uh, when they do photosynthesis. So this hole right here, there's multiple of them underneath the leaf. You'll see um, what will happen is oxygen will go in and CO2 will come out. The reason why it's on the bottom of the leaf is because this also prevents uh, desiccation from happening. So if the gas exchange holes were at the top, it'd be easier for water to escape the leaf. Vascularization uh, is basically when you have some kind of transport system to transport the water and nutrients through taller plants. So uh, moss are not vascularized, which means they don't have these tubes in them of xylem and phloem. And uh, trees are. So any type of anything that's basically off the ground, any type of plant that's off the ground besides moss, um, any type of bush, any tree uh, has xylem and phloem in it. So the xylem is what carries the water up the plant, which makes sense because Water usually lands on the ground and then filters up through the roots and then it has to go up to the leaves and the top branches. So xylem goes up the tree, whereas phloem, uh, phloem, the pH is pronounced like an F, phloem carries nutrients down the plant, so like even sugar. So in the leaves of a tree, when sugar uh, is created, like glucose, in the from the photosynthesis process in the leaves, it's got to get transported through the tree and then even down to the roots. So uh, phloem carries nutrients down the tree and xylem carries uh, water up the tree. So you need to have vascularization in taller plants because otherwise there'd be no way to get the sugar and the water through the plant. So there are two, um, there's many different types of phyla of plants, just like there's many different types of phyla of animals, but just to kind of break them all down into two big groups that you're very familiar with, um, there's the conifers and the anthophytes, or gymnosperms is what they're called. So uh, the conifers are basically any tree that has needles. So this would consist of the cedar trees, fir trees, uh, spruce trees, and pine trees. They use cones for reproduction. So there's going to be male and female cones on the trees. And these are known as the evergreens. And so you wouldn't want to lay floor with these types of woods because they're considered to be softer. And so they bend um, and they're damaged more easily. So these are the conifers here. So phylum coniferophyta. And then the second one is phylum anthophyta. And these are all the flowering plants. And it also includes some trees, like the trees that have broad leaves. So you can see over here, the pictures of the leaves here. So oak and maple and birch are all types of hardwoods. And instead of using cones, they use stamens and pistils uh, to be able to, uh, like the flowers, use stamens and pistils in, or in order to be able to reproduce. So these are all the flowering plants. So if you can think of any type of plant that has flowers or any trees that have broad leaves, these belong to phylum anthophyta. So then we had to label our picture of a flowering plant. Not all plants look like uh, this picture here, but they will have um, one carpeled in the middle, and then they'll have various amount of stamens around the outside. So here's your picture of the flower that you should have labeled already. So the stigma style and ovary goes in the center with the ovule there in the middle, 
and the stigma style and ovary, this whole part put together is called the carpal or the pistil, and that's the female part of the plant. And there can be many stamens. There could be three, there could be five, there could be 15. Um, the top part here is called the anther. That's where the pollen goes. And then it's held up by the filament. And the anther and filament together is the stamen, which is the male part of the flower. So the little, uh, they're like little extensions of this, of the stem. These are called the sepals or sepals. And uh, the petals, obviously, you know what those are. And there's obviously the stem here at the bottom. This is the stem. All right, so this is new to you, adaptations to harsh environments. So as you know, there are some plants that live in very extreme conditions, like for example, the rainforest, and those plants obviously have to be able to withstand a lot of water and not drown. Uh, the grasslands, you wouldn't think that think of that as an extreme environment, but because there aren't many hills to break the wind, these plants have to uh, persevere all of the wind that they um, that they live with. Same with uh, any plants that live in the desert um, and any plants that live in the tundra, which is a very cold area. So uh, you need to know how these plants adapt to those situations. So in the rainforest, a plant that lives in the rainforest has a couple of different adaptations. They have something called drip tips, which you can see in this picture right here. So what will happen is water will collect on the big leaves and then it will run down to a point, this drip tip here, and that basically allows for the water to break off of the plant. It collects and then and then breaks off. So it's important that they're kind of droopy because the water needs to run off the plant. Otherwise, if plant if water aggregates on the plant, then what happens is uh, bacteria can grow and it can infect the plant. So to prevent any type of infection for the plant, they also have a very smooth bark. So the bark will be smooth on these plants. Uh, in the rainforest, as well as they'll have thick cuticles, which will help the rain kind of um, fall and break off of the plant. They also have very shallow roots because um, if they had, it, it would waste energy to have deep roots because they get so much rain. There's lots of rain near the surface of the soil, so they'll have shallow roots because there's no point in spending all that energy making long roots when they don't need to. Um, and prop roots, which you see in this picture, uh, because the root system is so shallow, they can easily topple over. So sometimes what happens is if it's a tall plant, it will make extra like prop roots. And all these essentially do is they just keep the tree propped up. It's like extra support. Um, and epiphytes, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, so in grasslands where there's lots of wind and very little uh, mountain um, or hills to break the wind, uh, they tend to have soft stems because if they didn't have soft stems, if they had rigid stems, then what would happen is they would break off. Uh, they have long root systems because that basically helps them to anchor into the ground to keep them from getting ripped up. And like all grass, grass grows from the base uh, as opposed to from the top. So this is because of grazing animals. So if an animal came along here and ate this piece of grass, um, that part is damaged where they ripped off. So if you damage the system there for growing, then it wouldn't be able to grow. So it's important that the grass grows from the base, just like our hair. It's important that grass grows from the base because that part isn't damaged when an animal uh, eats the grass and then it can grow out. So if the animal eats the top of the grass, that would damage the systems for growing if that's how it did grow. In the desert, obviously it's very hot, so the plants there are very special and unique in that they can adapt to that warm environment. So plants that are in the desert tend to not have any leaves or they have very narrow leaves or very small leaves because the more foliage that you have, then you're more, you obviously need more water for those leaves to survive. And then you also get more transpiration, which is water leaving the plant and, and evaporating into the air. So you want less surface area for the leaves. Uh, and these plants tend to store water like cacti because they can go long periods of time without water. They tend to have long root systems because when it does rain, um, it needs like the roots need to be down deep into the soil in order to get enough moisture because it gets so hot during the day that all the soil at the top you know, the surface will get warm and all the water will evaporate. So they need to have longer root systems in order to reach the water that's deep down because 
everything near the top dries out. They have cuticles to pre- very thick cuticles to prevent a desiccation, which is drying out. They tend to grow slowly to conserve energy, and they have these little hairs on them sometimes, which apparently helps them for cooling. It, co- it cools them down and it keeps them shaded. So like this plant here, he uses his hairs as uh, shade. And then the last one is tundra. So this is basically, um, it would be like in the tundra of Alaska or in Antarctica um, or like far north or far south basically. So tundra is just basically really, really cold environments that tend to lack any type of precipitation. Um, and they're vast too. So the plants here tend to be smaller because they have to conserve their energy. They have shallow root systems because of the permafrost. So uh, the soil that is further below the surface of the ground tends to stay frozen. So there's no point in their root systems reaching down that far. So they've got to stay near the surface. So if you can imagine this is the surface here, the root system won't go too far down. It's going to stay up near the top because this layer is the only layer that heats up during the day with the sun and it's the only layer that's going to thaw. So the root systems have to stay near the top otherwise they're permanently frozen and then the plant will die. So they tend to be dark in color to draw um, the heat's light. If you can think of if when it's warm out you want to wear lighter colors as opposed to darker colors because the darker colors absorb more light. Um, they have little hairs for insulation and they tend to grow in clumps. Basically like if you were very cold you'd want to get to get together and share your body heat. That's kind of what they do too. They stay clumped together and then they have less surface area um, exposed to the elements. All right and the last thing we're going to talk about is tropisms and tropisms are movements of plants that are caused by different stimuli. So um, you may know of some ty- different types of ivy that people tend to grow up walls and they'll stick to walls. So this is called thigmatropism. It means that the plants, they react to a sense of touch. So you can see this plant here, he's reacting to the stick and the stick's there to help the plant grow upwards instead of growing along the ground. So they can sense that something is there. They can sense touch and then uh, they'll react to that by binding to it and then growing up the stick. Uh, Gravitropism is something that all plants do. So they react to gravity, that's what that means. And uh, all plants, their root systems will grow towards the center of the earth and their shoots or their stems will always grow away from the earth. So it doesn't matter what you do, you could set up an experiment uh, where you try to grow a plant upside down, such as um, this, this here, a lot of hanging tomato plants. Uh, are set up like this. So what will happen is their root systems are confined to this basket so they will stay in here. Um, But what will happen is some of the shoots of the tomato uh, plant will actually start to turn and try to grow away from gravity. So even though like the gravity is pulling the plant down, the shoots realize that they're supposed to grow away from gravity so they will turn up and you can see that in a lot of plants. Um, You can even see if you took a plant and tipped it over on its side uh, so that, um, like this plant right here, say if you knocked it over on its side, you would see that the plant uh, would start to grow up away from gravity. Hydrotropism is sensing water around the plant. So if you have a hole here filled with water in the soil and then you have a plant over here, the root system is always water seeking and it's going to start to grow towards the water. So it senses the water, it senses the moisture and then goes towards it. And chemotropism is the last one. Chemotropism is used for the fertilization process of the flowers. So chemotropism just means that you're reacting to different chemicals. So what will happen is when the pollen comes off the anther, and is deposited on the pistil, which is the female part of the flower, by like an insect or something. Um, once it lands here, it will actually, the plant will realize that it's in the right spot, or the pollen grain will realize it's in the right spot, and it will start to grow down uh, the shaft of the pistil, which is the style, and then it'll go towards the ovule to fertilize it. So, I mean, that's how sperm um, know where the egg is in the female, when a female uh is ejaculated into because the they sense the chemicals coming off of the egg and that's how they make their way. It's not like they stop and ask for directions. All right, so that concludes the plant section. Um, so when you go to class tomorrow, we're going to be having a formative quiz on all of classification. 
um, on the Sentio. So that'll probably take about half of class to do. And you'll be expected to have all these notes written down.